Hi everyone, this is a video on Gestalt concepts and some Gestalt phenomena or examples. Uh, the shirt I've got on today says Leipzig. That's where it all got started. It's not directly relevant to Gestalt psychology uh, necessarily. Um, but, but Gestalt psychology is really interesting and it's fun. It might not have had the biggest impact on psychology um, probably not as big an impact as some flavors of behaviorism or functionalism or uh, cognitive psychology, um, but certainly has had an impact. So I like this uh, sort of introductory slide, if you will. Um, maybe you can make out the word gestalt there. It's spelled in small orange dots. Um, so the letters don't actually appear there in full form, but they do appear to be letters. I think they should appear that way to you because of the arrangement of the dots. If you looked at any one or a small group of those dots that make up the word gestalt, it wouldn't make any sense. But all them together form and no pun intended here, right? They form a, a gestalt. They form a word that should be having some meaning for you by now. Um, speaking of that, in this video I'm going to talk about some key features of a gestalt system here in History and Systems. Um, talk a little bit about visual perception and insight learning. Uh, first, Here's a little visual reminder, a timeline. It's in orange. My uh, Gestalt Psychology slides are, uh, feature orange. Um, and impossible to make out here, but circled in that yellow circle are the Gestalt Psychologists, um, in particular the Three Musketeers, um, Wertheimer, Kohler, and Kafka, and also Kurt Lewin. This image here shows some key features of the Gestalt system. These will be familiar to you from the chapter in our textbook. You might want to pause the video here if you want to just double check uh, these uh, here. Uh, and they help to organize uh, some of the examples. So let's look at some visual perception examples. Um, this is just kind of fun, but also there's some importance to them. So you recall that uh, Wertheimer, when he got off of the train in Frankfurt in about 1910, got himself a stroboscope and uh, discovered uh, a phi phenomenon uh, or apparent movement. So here's a simple example of um, phi phenomenon. There's a ball that appears to be bouncing. It's really just made up of a bunch of individual slides that I put together. And if the slides are played at just the right speed, one after the other, you get this effect of visual perception that the ball is moving. It appears as though the ball is moving. The ball never moves. There isn't a ball, in fact, right? It's an orange dot. Uh, but it appears to move. The elemental slides, when played to the visual system in just a certain way, um, create a compelling illusion of movement. And we get this all the time when we watch uh, DVD videos, when we stream Netflix uh, shows. Um, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing a series of individual still images played to our eyes, and they're played just so. And we go, oh, that's nice, smooth uh, movement. There are many other uh, and fun examples of gestalt in um, visual perception. So here's the classic vase, or profiles if you will, and um, if you can switch back and forth, if you can see two somewhat meaningful um, visual experiences here, the vase and the silhouettes in profile, um, then this is very hard to explain using an SR approach. You'll see it says SR with a question mark there uh, because it's very difficult for the strict SR approach to explain 
two distinct experiences from one stimulus, right? Remember that the strict SR version of behaviorism says when there's one stimulus, there's one response. Well, here's the, here there's one stimulus. It's this pattern of black and white. Um, but there could be more than one response. Um, here's another one of my favorites. This is the, uh, this is the dog. Uh, you might see a dog here. Of course, there isn't really a dog. Um, you could imagine these black splotches being arranged, um, you know, really, really differently than they are here. And it wouldn't make any sense, right? All the same individual elements might be shown to you, uh, but only when they're arranged this way might you get the perception of a dog. It's a gestalt. The elements separately or in a pile on the floor there, don't make a whole lot of sense. But then when they're arranged together in a certain way, you get this kind of useful symphony or gestalt of a dog. I'm going to show you a little video clip next um, that helps to illustrate gestalt and the importance of context in, in vision. Here we go. Okay, this is one of my favorites, and it may help with understanding what a gestalt is. This is an example of uh, how a mental ability, here visual perception, um, involves the uh, information in um, combinations of many of the elements that there are to see. Uh, and so focus on the square marked B here, and um, you should be able to notice that the visual information that is around B makes a difference in how bright the square marked B seems to, to be. So compare actually B to the square marked A here. So it's interesting that as you start to strip away the uh, contextual information, the other visual cues that are around A and B that you start to notice, oh, A and B might now look very similar in how gray or bright gray they are. So a gestalt, of course, means that the effect that we experience here, the visual effect, um, is due to a combination of factors, um, many of which are important, uh, and not just one isolated thing uh, in what we see is um, all that there is to understand. This does not fit with the SR view. Remember the behaviorist, right? The Gestalt psychologists are saying, hey, there's all this uh, stuff that doesn't fit with the strict behaviorism. Um, if you always saw B a certain way, but you don't, then there would be this one S, it would be the stimulus mark to B, and there'd always be one response, be, oh, B is just like A. Well, it doesn't appear to be all the time, does it? All right, pretty, pretty cool. Pretty cool. I hope uh, that had meaning for you. Uh, in the last part of this video, I wanted to talk about uh, insight learning and um, problem solving with uh, one of those three Gestalt Musketeers, uh, Wolfgang Kohler. You remember reading that he did um, insight learning uh, research um, on an island uh, with chimpanzees. I'm just going to give you an example here uh, that's a little bit elaborated. This picture is in the, is in the book. I wanted to say a little bit more about this uh, to give it some more context. So I really, really like this picture here. Um, pay particular attention to the chimpanzee that's down on the ground. Um, I really like this. Okay, so he or she is, you know, kind of doing this thing, you know, looking up like, hmm, what is going on there? Uh, and this is pretty meaningful, I think, because Kohler noticed that his chimps, often when they were trying to figure out a solution to a problem, like shown here, where you had to stack up the boxes in order to get up to be able to obtain the piece of banana, uh, that there would be this long pause 
that the animals would be, you know, maybe fiddling around with the box or the stuff that was available in their environment, um, not solving the problem, and then sooner or later they would kind of stop. They would kind of survey the situation. Um, there'd be this hmm, kind of thing going on, and then what Kohler thought he noticed, and we think this is basically something that happens, really, uh, in some uh, forms of problem solving, in, in insight learning problems, that uh, there's this pause, this, there's this perusing the situation, taking in the elements, and then there's this sort of sudden behavior that produces the goal. So this chimp down on the floor is looking, and then Kohler was reporting that uh, rather suddenly then the chimp would realize, oh, I've got to stack up these boxes and would um, go up and be able to get the banana seemingly quite easily. Um, this is important in a sense. It seems like it might be a little important um, today or with respect to cognitive psychology in modern times. You remember that uh, Thorndike with his cats in the puzzle boxes, said that learning occurs gradually, right? The SR association is stamped in gradually. Uh, insight learning seems to happen pretty rapidly. There might be the appearance of very little learning, and then boom, uh, all of a sudden, uh, it seems like the chimps or the other animals have figured things out um, rather rapidly. And it seems like, yes, it depends on the problem now, we would say, in psychology uh, today. Uh, sometimes learning is very gradual, sometimes it's, it's very quick. Uh, this kind of thing seems to apply to human learning also. So here's an example. It's called the nine-dot problem. Maybe you can make this out. There are nine dots. And what you're supposed to do here is, you might want to do this on your own paper, uh, some paper in front of you, and uh, maybe pause the video. Uh, you make nine dots in this um, three by three kind of arrangement. And uh, if you don't know this problem already, the instructions are to connect these nine dots using four straight lines that you make continuously without picking up your writing utensil off of the paper. So start somewhere, connect all four of the dots without picking up your pencil and use just four lines. Four lines. One, two, three, four. So in fact, if you try this, or if, if you've tried this, oftentimes, and we know this from the research now, it's very tempting. People tend to look at this and they, and they go, okay, well, all I have to do is, uh, you know, go up and over and down and back, and then you go, crap, that's not going to work because you kind of start off trying to make a box. And here you have to think outside of the box, as it turns out. That might be a helpful clue. Usually when people figure out the solution to insight problems, such as this nine-dot problem, there's this kind of aha moment, a little bit like the chimps, where, you know, there's not a whole lot going on. They're sort of perusing the situation. Now you're going, what's up with these nine dots? And uh, then maybe suddenly... Uh, the solution presents itself, and the puzzle can be solved pretty rapidly. You do, in, ha in fact, have to think outside of the box here some in order to um, get the solution. So I'll show you how it works. If you pause uh, here, you won't get the solution yet, um, but I'm going to go ahead and show you uh, the solution here, uh, and it goes like this. Okay, see that? You can play it back if you need to. And I want to introduce this term, cognitive restructuring. So what the chimps might have been doing in their insight learning problem um, circumstances and for people uh, doing insight learning, like with this nine-dot problem, the first time that these problems are solved, there might be this kind of aha uh, moment, a uh, quick solution uh, results, uh, because there's a kind of uh, rethinking, restructuring of the problem, of understanding uh, what to do, a kind of cognitive restructuring. So the Gestalt psychologists were really looking a lot like cognitive psychologists in some ways, right? And studying a kind of cognitive psychology. All right, that's what I've got for Gestalt psychology for today. Thanks for watching.